Hi there, Dr. Matthew Dunn here with the future of email marketing. And my guest today is Kenneth Burke, VP of Marketing for Text Request from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Kenneth, thanks so much for responding to uh, the invitation and joining me here today. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Tell us a bit about Text Request. Yeah, so kind of the opposite of a campaign genius. We're a text messaging software company for businesses to be able to, you know, text with their customers, Mm -hmm. um, manage that all under, you know, one professional roof so that it's professional and compliant and collaborative. And so you can see who's talking with whom and what they're saying and all that. You know, I I have to, I have to sidebar in the personalization, the personal side for a second, literally the last, the last guest on the podcast on, on Friday, (laughs) was from Chattanooga, Tennessee as well. Oh, yeah. What are the odds? Yeah, really. It's the, it's the town, for me at least, it's the town famous for uh, for bandwidth and innovation, right? Municipal fiber network. Yeah, um, 10, uh, 10 gigabit speed throughout the whole city. So Right. Has great. that actually spurred um, you know startups and companies and innovation for the area? It has. And I was actually just reading another, I'm a huge champion for Chattanooga. But yeah. one of the things I was just reading 20 minutes before I jumped on here was how we're another outlet named us uh, the number one city for work from home or for remote workers. And a big yeah. piece of it is that, that exactly that, that, that gigabit speed internet. That's just, you know, foundational every- to the community. Yeah. And so people, they come here and they, I talk to another person every week who's moving from Dallas or somewhere in California, or New York uh, for, you know, to, and they have digital businesses. And so it's a really easy switch for them. But yeah, I was uh, I, I was going to ask if you're getting an influx of people as as you know as moves as place shifts around in in this pandemic and post pandemic. You know, if I can work mm-hmm. from anywhere, dot dot dot, yeah, anywhere right there's here. bandwidth. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. My uh, my friend Paul Schreiner, who's the co-founder of Audience Point, was the guest on on Friday. And oh, yeah. uh, do you know them? Uh, I'm familiar with Audience Point. I don't know Paul personally, but okay. I'm with uh, Audience Point. I I will. I promised. I promised to connect the two of you afterwards. You may have some may have some other interest in common. He's a great guy as well. Um, so I got you off track almost right off the bat. Text request businesses. Yes, are there particular kinds of businesses, size, industry, whatever that tend to be your customers at this stage? There. Well, we do work with about 100 different industries, so it's pretty oh, wow. broad, uh, but we tend to fall into a few key categories. Home services, mm-hmm. so your landscapers, your cleaners, your electricians, um, professional services, financial advisors, insurance accountants, lawyers, those kind of all get grouped together. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the, the two big ones. A lot of nonprofits, uh, some government okay. agencies, education, I can go on. Yeah, yeah. Education as well. Interesting, like colleges as well. Mm-hmm. Private schools, colleges, and universities. Yeah, I would, I would, I would think that I would think that would be really effective for them. You've been at the company a fair stretch yourself, right? Yeah, so I've been here just over six years now. Um, so I started two months about after we launched. So oh wow, since day one, yeah. Wow, and, good for you. It's, uh, and and obviously some some growth. Just judging from the number of industries you mentioned, how's how's that been? Going through that, have you been through that ride with a relatively young company before and r- ridden along with the growth? No, this was first for me. So, I mean, the only other experience I had, I mean, I had jobs before, but the only other experience with like a, a business working with that many different industries was, you know, working in that CPA firm. Oh, wow. Very different. You know? a CP- from a CPA firm to marketer at a texting company. Give us, a, give us a brief, you know, like career snapshot. How'd you land, end up doing what you're doing? Uh, it was serendipitous, really. So, uh, again, CPA background. Or I actually went to college to study music. Um, what do you around. play? Uh, guitar mainly, but it was at the time, you know, you have to you have to educate your right, so you have to play several different things. So, violin yeah. and piano were yeah. were my two others. Um, <laughs> and then I was a terrible vocalist. But uh, anyway, so flipped around a little bit. Ended up in psychology. Really loved that. Um, really found my place there mm-hmm. um but then got out of the education side of it and went into uh financial planning so putting that background to use and then i also got married my wife and i wanted to move back to chattanooga um i wanted to get out of of finance mm-hmm. and a friend of mine from college was one of the people one of the the 
founding five to start text request. And I said, that sounds really interesting. Let me just come join you. And yeah. he said, okay. So nice. At that nice. time it was cold calling colleges. And when, when did the company are. start? 2014, November, 2014. Okay. Okay. Interesting. There's a, there's a company in Seattle called Tatango. I don't know if you've run into them. I'm familiar. Mm -hmm. You are. Okay. So quick, but quick, but funny side story. I remember sitting in Derek Johnson's basement. He's the CEO of Tatango. He was a kid just out of college from my town, Bellingham, Washington. And he was getting ready to pitch the local angel investors on how text was going to become a, a, an honest to goodness marketing channel. And we were sitting in his parents' basement five miles from here talking through the business plan and stuff. And I look at, you know, I look at how it's exploded then, since, since then. I'm like, Derek, good on you, buddy. <laughs> like, yeah, he's right. You were right. And then the, the question that's always posed to me, I don't know if you had this on your list or not, but text is a great channel. It's an additional channel for most people who haven't been doing it before. And so communications experts or, or leaders always ask, okay, well, well, there's another option. Yeah. How do we make sure we aren't overwhelming people? Yeah. And I always think that's an interesting question because I mean, it comes down to consumer preferences, right? Like uh, people need to be able to choose how they're going to interact with you and you need to be able to accommodate that. Some people really want email and they only want email. Some people mm -hmm. really want text and they only want text. Some mm -hmm. people want uh, a mix of that plus social, maybe a direct mail thrown in here and there. Yeah. So when you're talking with uh, customers or prospective customers, um, is there is there any consistent line that says likely to be for this purpose, not for that purpose? Like, how do you see those two, at least email marketing and, and text um, tending to coexist in people's preferences? Yeah, it's it's hard to say across the board because I'm thinking of all the different types of industries you work with. Like if I'm talking to a college and their their customer or the person they're communicating with is a, a student who's 16, 17 years old, what's going to work every time for them is very different from the CPA firm who has middle-aged clients, right? Mm -hmm. um, but typically, I think of it as uh, texting is going to be for short back and forths. Right. Uh, so things like scheduling, things like quick updates, things like um, confirmations or last minute reminders. It's mm -hmm. great for that. The mm -hmm. response time on a text is, I mean, the average response time is 90 seconds. Most people see a wow. text instantly. Wow. Yeah. Um, so it really aids to the to those use cases, whereas email a lot of times it, you see it leans towards really like, rich content. Yeah. Or, you know, detailed promotions or... Yep. Um, Newsletters, which you can share newsletters and links through through text messaging. Uh, many people these days do still prefer it through an email. Yeah, uh, and then receipts and record keeping, right? Like if you create a new account, you want those details logged so you can go quickly search it. Um, especially entrepreneurs want receipts because they can just file and lock things away really easily, and you right. kind of filter things that way. Right. Detail conversations and email intros, you know, to different people. But right, right now, um. Texting, texting has been around for a while and there's really, you've got standards starting to sort of build up on top of each other. You know, the original SMS, which was the control channel for the cellular network. Um, obviously, we've gone past that at a technical level. Uh, text, re uh, text request delivers what kind of messages? Yeah, SMS and MMS. MMS, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's, that's what I expected. Um, I had followed with considerable interest um, Google's attempt to make a rich communication service a, a more broad industry standard. You know, essentially, can we take can we take the kind of thing you get with private messaging channels, WhatsApp, Apple iMessages, or whatever, and get some universal? Everybody talks the same way to each other, and it, it looks like that didn't stick. Is that uh, is that a fair assessment? More or less, in in. The unofficial take is that um, it's kind of back to your Android iOS battle yeah, yeah, where yeah. Apple has pretty much said, hey, we've got all this baked in into to iMessage. Yep. If yeah. you want that rich content, just use us. And Google's saying, you know, well, let's make it kind of a um, common universe source for everyone. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. there have been some talks about, um, and we're keeping a very close eye on it because it would make a lot of sense oh to, sure to follow this route but um there have been a lot of talks of, of them 
reconciling, so to speak, or yeah. is there being some kind of alternative where everyone can can play in the same sandbox? Um, but it, it is an interesting ongoing conversation. I, I I'd have to say my read on it because you know I throw rocks and prognosticate for fun sometimes. <laughs> if you if you look at the the battleground around privacy now, it seems to me more unlikely that Apple and Google would reach detente on messaging because they don't seem to see consumer privacy in at all the same way. And Apple in particular is, is really staking some brand equity on, nope, we'll, we'll cover it, we'll protect, you know, we'll, we'll get rid of phone IDs, the IDFA that change that they're, they're talking about making. And it's like trying to get, trying to reconcile and work together and still preserve that strikes me as a big lift. Yeah, it's a great point. And it's also interesting how like Apple last couple of years in particular has really put their money where their mouth is, you know, mm -hmm. new product updates specifically around that. It's not just them saying they're going, yeah. to, I guess that goes back to the, what was it? 2015 where the, the FBI asked them to unlock a phone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's also interesting that Google's been coming along and creating verified SMS where you can, you know, they're verifying your, it, it that's a, actually a whole bigger trend in, in telecom right now anyway, but um, going through verified SMS or verifying that these are real businesses sending legitimate messages to real people to, to cut back on, on spam because that's been, become such a huge problem. Uh, spam, spam and text SMS and MMS has become a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it's like anything, right? I mean, if you can get a message out to a lot of people quickly, someone's going to find someone's going to abuse it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we we've uh, in 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 our platform campaign genius, we make occasional use of uh, APIs from Twilio, and mm -hmm. I'm sure you're more than familiar with them. And I always look and say, "Gosh, I'll bet I know how those those dorks that just you know spammed my." my inbox on my phone, my texted me on my phone a minute ago, I'm betting they spun it up, said a bunch and then beat feet out of town. It's gotta be pretty a much. I mean, a, a lot of times we've seen it, you know, it's, it's a stolen credit card. They buy a list of contacts and then they, you know, they'll go until you get shut off unless you're able to stop them before they start. Right. So, right. Anyway. So, so there, there's a lot of people out there, Apple included, you know, who, and yeah. Google we're, we're all working to, and I'm sure you as well, you know, make sure people can't do that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's such a it, messaging, texting, such a, I, I think of it as a fairly intimate. It's a high priority interrupt if you're old enough to know what that means, right? It's like being, and I mean, literally, we're sitting here having this conversation. I muted my phone, but it lit up because there was a text from my wife. And of course, I looked at it immediately, like, you know, less than 90 seconds. And you said 90 seconds is the average. Yeah, it it's, uh, but I, for me, and I'm curious to know what you see in terms of the patterns for your customers, I'm, I'm pretty picky about who I want to hear from on that channel. Mm -hmm. Fair? Like, you got to really earn me not saying, shut it off, don't bother, don't, don't get me here. Oh, yeah. And I, I think one thing that's really interesting, well, there's a few things that come together to be really interesting. One is... It, any report, pretty much any sampling, about 90% of people say they do want to text with businesses back and forth. Right. They're wow. Not saying, they're not saying they want to be added to a list. Yeah. But they're saying that if they have a question about sales or service, yeah, I would either like to receive info through a text or I would like to text a question. Okay. Um, okay. So that's one piece that's really interesting. There's another that um, email, and I would say this is a good thing, but collecting email addresses and email marketing has become a really easy way to get someone into your pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, people are pretty willing to give up their email address in exchange for a discount or an ebook or something. Right. And you are seeing that with, with text. Really? It's more, there's a few retail companies doing it really well um, nice. in particular. And then there's, um, like our local newspaper, you know, uses it for really uh, for different updates, which I love. I think, right. I mean, if you, it's great, particularly during the, the COVID crisis or whenever it was, um, I guess in its most stressful part or most, uh, where there's the most misinformation going on and no one really had any idea what was true or not. They mm -hmm. did a great thing. Chattanooga Times Free Press. Um, shout out. 
<laughs> where they they would pull together the the five most important pieces of info each mm -hmm. week mm -hmm. and then they would say hey if you want us to just text us to you know subscribe here and we'll just text it to you um i loved it i thought it was great you know I, anyway a lot of people enjoy receiving updates like that right but yeah. the big thing for for the text is like you said it is a little more intimate it's a little more personal and so if they're going to um I'm thinking specifically for marketing, for getting on a list. If they're going to get on a list, it needs to be a very clear opt-in that, hey, I am yeah. Yeah. opting in for this specific thing at this specific frequency. And then if you, um, you know, if you break my trust, then I'm going to opt out. Right, right. And that's kind of a fair, fair statement for any channel. Yep. Um, it is interesting that the for those who opt in, the lifetime from what we can see, the lifetime opt out rate is under 5%. So once people wow. are in, they're very loyal. Wow. Yeah. I think it's fascinating. Wow. That is fascinating. Um, you talked a bit about the, the, the diversity of the customer base, the text request serves. Um, broadly speaking, what's, what's the, what's the, where are they coming from when they end up finding, you know, finding you and becoming a customer and putting it under that kind of you know business management umbrella that you described early on is is it the overworked intern who says I can't keep doing this from my phone or what are they coming from when they end up with you? Yeah, so there's uh, well, there's kind of three three sects or three types of companies or profiles. There we go, buyer personas. Buyer personas. Uh, drop the buzzwords. Um, we have a, there's a small business persona where it's typically either an owner operator or an office administrator who's running everything. So they're touching payments and customer service and sales and feedback and everything. Okay. Um, and in their case, that's that one owner or head of office who's they're overwhelmed, they're overworked and they say, I need something better. Okay. And so usually it's them saying, usually it's them reaching out, like them, them realizing they have a problem. They're searching for it. It's a pretty active market now, which is great. Mm -hmm. So people are primarily coming to us. Um, sometimes it's, you know, a, an email sent out to them, right place, right time. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Or a social media post that I had two people last week that said, Hey, Kenneth, that's all, you know, such and such on social. And that resonated with me. Mm -hmm. So can we talk? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one type. Another type is, is more that mid market where you either have multiple, uh, locations multiple branches or you have multiple distinct departments and okay. so well a lot of times we'll have a branch manager or a vp of sales come to us and say hey we you know we're having to call customers five six eight times and then we're barely reaching anyone and it's right. killing our operations right right um so we need to bake something in and then the third is more of an enterprise use case where they need to build something themselves and like you mentioned twilio earlier you know it becomes a, a conversation of do I want to go with a, a Twilio where, um, you know, the world's my oyster, but I have to build it myself? Or do I want to go with something that's a little more, uh, that's already built out? That's kind of a plug and play. Okay. Um, okay. You know, and then yeah. there's that builder buy conversation. Does that yeah. answer the question or were, were you going more <laughs> yeah. customer acquisition channel? I wasn't worried about the acquisition channel. I was just trying to get a beat on, um, I, I, you know, on the, on the call, let's call it, communications, uh, you know, communications maturity cycle that says, okay, this, this channel texting is now a viable piece of my business, whether it's operations or marketing or information in the case of your newspaper, it's not just a one-off happenstantial thing. It's like, there's some, de there's some deliberation to it. And it becomes a, that list, I would assume becomes an asset, especially at a 5% churn rate like oh for sure and right, something that's fantastic. unique to us too or at least has been you know since we've started uh or would distinguish us from a tango is we have focused on conversations mm -hmm. from the start mm -hmm. um so marketing is a part of that right like you can text from your your landline what have you and and text hundreds of thousands of people mm -hmm. um promotions and to drive sales uh but what we really focus on is is creating conversations so getting your customers to text into you, you know, from your website or from whatever else you've got going on. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you've got an update or you need to, to engage with them in some way to be able to say, you know, uh, Hey Matt, can you get me that sample? Or, you know, uh, following up on the estimate, did, did you have any questions? Um, 
to start those conversations. So it's so a little on the bit different than just list making. Yeah, a little different than just list making uh, and definitely could become much more of a, a conversation channel. I think not just a, not, not just a uh, broadcast out to lots of people channel. So in terms of the, in terms of the tool set from your company, does that mean that a customer that's really rocking it with text request may have multiple employees, uh, you know, logged in and paying attention to that channel? Yes. And it, it depends on the situation. Again, like if it's a, you know, a smaller company, it might just be an office administrator or maybe yeah. it's one person buys. I, you see this all the time, you know, one person buys the account, one other person actually uses it. Okay. Yeah, um, interesting. But then there's, I mean, there's probably, I won't give a number, but there's a substantial percentage of ours who they, of our customers who they come on and then they add everyone in the company just right. about as a user. Um, or they'll create different accounts, you know, dig different logins for um, different departments. You know, it's been, I'm jumping, I'm jumping around a little bit, but, you know, w watching, uh, if, what was the best moniker for it? Let's just say messaging super generically, like short back and forth and initial at least uh, written language text centric. You had, um, I forget the name of the company. I think they were from Israel, one of the first, messaging systems to take off. They got bought. Um, you had WhatsApp and a whole class of private messaging kind of explode. And now that's petered out. And now the ones that are very, very privacy focused as private channels, the uh, Telegram and Signals, appear to be having a bit of a day in the sun. I, I don't know how long that'll last as well. And then that long, slow, steady from the signal channel SMS to overlaying MMS so that you can get a little richer conversation going on that is never going to go away because it's going to be very hard for someone to pry this phone number out of my hands, right? If you've got this number, you've got a very long-term relationship with me, which is where you guys sit. Yeah. And that was, that was actually something I scribbled down before the conversation was it's really interesting to me how many people keep a phone number longer than they keep an email address? Oh, not, yeah. Yeah. not not an email at all, but I mean, you get a phone number yeah. when you're 13 years old. A lot of, I still have the same number I've always had. <laughs> right. You know, I know right. a lot of people who have, sometimes you change it when you move to a new city, but then you have to change, you know, tell all your contacts, all that jazz. Yeah. Um, no, I think I, I would, have you seen any studies about that? I'd be curious. Like how long are people keeping? I haven't seen it? anything formal. I mean, I've seen some anecdotal, anecdotal stuff. Yeah. I haven't seen anything formal. Now that we've talked about it, I need to go see if I can dig something up. Um, I'll I mean, bet I think about the long. average person changes jobs every three months or sorry, <sighs> not every three months, every three years. Three years yeah. Go. Um, that's a new email address every time. And you've got sure. your one Gmail or sure. Outlook or you yeah. know, AOL you've had for ever. Yeah. But. Yeah. But, 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 you know, the, the phone, which is now the mobile phone, right? My, uh, my older son, when he hit that stage where it was like, okay, we're going to get him a phone, got him a phone and he ended up with the last four digits of his number being the month and year he was born. Huh. Nice coincidence. And complete coincidence. Right. But I remember thinking, He's never going to give this number up ever, right? No, <laughs> like no way. And you, you, when you get it fanned out, and you're in, you know, you're in un, an unknown number of address books out there, or lists of businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, 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 I think you're right. And email addresses being used as intentional temporaries is so common as well. Like, oh, I'll keep a, you know, I'll go sign up for a free Gmail account and put all of my promotional crap there because why because i don't want it in my regular inbox sure mm -hmm. why not but you don't you don't idly do that with your phone well and it's interesting too you were talking about the different messaging channels like whatsapp and telegram and all and yeah. you're right i mean there are just so many options now for messaging every social media platform has a messaging tool baked into it um you know a lot of a lot of other apps that businesses have you know that would be kind of not single use, but have one purpose. Yeah. You know, I'm getting this to interact with this business. You know, even those have uh, messaging baked into them. And I, I think what will be really interesting is to see long term who comes, and we're working towards it some, but who comes out uh, to pull all those channels together into one place. Hmm. If, that, so that yeah, if they can. Back and forth. Yeah. If they, if they can. It's, it's also, and I think this is true of email as well. 
I've joked with people, you know, cocktail party conversation, whatever, that the one thing we left off the internet was identity. Cause, cause really early, early underpinnings, all of the early protocols, you, there was no who, <laughs> right? And people use email somewhat like identity. Uh, someone in email marketing will say, well, if you don't have an email address, you're digitally homeless. Okay, agreed, but I don't have just one. And almost nobody has just one. And you could say email address is, you know, is, very, is a very personal thing. But as you said, you'll have multiple business addresses over time. And you have to deal with cleaning that up as you're done. All of that's not true of the mobile number now. Like that's a very intimate, close to an I, you know, close to an identity level thing. That number. My son's never going to give that number up. You've had the same one your whole life. Like, wow, that's 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 a really high bar in terms of the value of that uh, connecting point between you and other people. Yeah, and especially if you draw from that and you start thinking about customer lifetime value or, or having. I mean, even if you're. I was talking to a, someone who runs a, a marketing agency for furniture retailers last week. Mm -hmm. um, and he was saying their, their typical customer buys, or like on, on average, a furniture customer buys or replaces furniture once every eight years. Okay. And so, and so my question is, how do, you, how do you create a loyal customer that way, right? When they're coming to you once every eight years, maybe, yeah. maybe there's an opportunity or two mixed in there somewhere, but it's, it's incredibly infrequent. Yeah. Um, but you know, you're talking about you keep the same, same number, same piece of identity over time. That can be a great way to, so, to keep people engaged and stay with them. So the challenge for that, for the marketing use in that case, is how do you how do you stay in contact without and 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 make it a valuable conversation? You don't want to just keep sending them ads for furniture if they're not going to buy for years. You're just eventually they're going to go just be like bozo filter. Stop, right? Stop sending me stuff. Yeah, you're right. It's a tough equation. It's a tough, I mean, email, email's got this somewhat the same thing, but I think you touched on it. There's a, there's a degree of tolerance with email because it's not such a high priority interrupt because the, the sort of tool set for, eh, I'll get to that later. And the habits are more built in. Yeah. And you, I, I think about it from a little bit different angle. I, I think of, um, my bias will show, but I think of text as a right now and I think of email as a maybe later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so text, yeah. like if I'm trying to get quick engagement or I need to, we have customers all the time who they'll send, you know, they need a, a, a boost in sales at the end of the month. So they'll send every, all their past customers a, a text, you know, the last week and try to, to drive more bookings right. or services, you know, what have you. Um, but then I think of email where I'm, I'm getting 10 things a day that I have zero interest in, but you know, on, on Saturdays when I'm, I might go to a shop where I, I think about, Oh, I want to get a new book or buy a new whatever, or my wife mm -hmm. wants this. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go look for that coupon that was just sent to me. Right. Right. So I'll go yeah. back and look it up. And anyway, um, so I think of uh, like email is there as a record I can go back to. Yeah. Yeah. Want which, to engage with me right now, you know, it's a text. Which doesn't uh, my, my, my wife deletes, message threads uh text message threads no matter who they're from like she doesn't keep them all she deletes them um but she keeps email forever and mm -hmm. and i'm almost at inbox zero which is a whole nother conversation never thought that would happen doesn't mean they're deleted it just means they're out of mind right yeah but my text messaging <laughs> records go back years i'm like eh, i might want to look at it later i'll keep mm -hmm. it particularly when it's from you know friends and family and stuff like that we flip-flop on on that uh on that matrix i did want to ask you i mean as 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 marketing vp you also probably end up with a hand in email as a channel as well like tell me about coexisting with those two things in your job yeah it, it's kind of interesting too because we one cold email done properly can be a great sales acquisition channel. Yeah. And so we're, uh, I mean, we're kind of phasing out of the startup phase. We've been profitable for years, but you know, a, a bootstrap startup. And so sure, uh, we had to figure out how to, how to get sales quickly. Yeah. You, I would never advise cold texting people. Um, <sighs> no. Politics or nonprofits is the only exception or non-commercial use is the only exception. But even then people, well, there are too many there there are too many cooks in the kitchen trying to do the same thing to mm -hmm. reach the same people, so it just creates problems. Um, you need more of a centralized approach, but um, 
anyway, cold email was something that worked really well for us. And then, you know, I mean, the stuff you do all the time, re-engagement for cold leads or for just keeping customers in the loop. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we still send out, you know, a, a newsletter every week. Dude, okay. Um, we've got, you know, different email campaigns going on all the time. You know, we've got someone who half their job is, is email or we've got two people who have their jobs are email. So I guess like one full-time position. Um, wow. Okay. So it's yeah. still, it's part of, it's part of the business still. Well, I mean, it needs to be right. Like, y- yeah. you know, this, there's, I mean, speaking from a, a text message company, like text needs to be a part of how you communicate. Yeah. So does email. People use email to communicate with each other. People text to communicate with each other. People are on social media to communicate with each other. People are on, you know, Google searching for what they need. They're in forums discussing their problems. You need to be in all these places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. if you miss one, you're, you know, you're missing out and emails. It's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I did, you know, as one of the through lines of this conversation so far, you know, ditto texting, right. It's like, it's not going to, it's not going to go away. Um, it's, it's, I, I happen to use uh, an iPhone, and I'm a, and I'm a Mac head. If I'm freely admit I'm a Mac head. <laughs> um, although I worked at Microsoft for ten years, so I actually knew Windows inside and out as well. But I'm like, please give me my Mac back. <laughs> but I get my I get my messages on my on my desktop as well. But I still think of the locus of that channel as being the my my mobile device, not my desktop. Conversely. I don't do much email on the phone. I'll mostly deal with it at the desktop. Do you see anything about consumer behavior? That is, is that just an, an edge case or do people mostly keep texting on their phone? Um, it, it's a bit of a mix. I mean, all I have, I don't have much data from our customers, customers, mm-hmm. except for, you know, the aggregates that you can find anywhere. Um, Yeah, because I'm trying to think most, I mean, it is it is edge case that messages, like your situation is edge case that messages, people still use it from desktop from, devices. From desktop, yeah. Now you yeah. see it with, with uh, like iPads, you know, or okay. tablets all the time. Yeah, interesting. Uh, people have them synced, but, yeah. you know, there, there's still fewer people who have a tablet as well. Yeah. Uh, but it's interesting, you talk about, you do all your email on, on your desktop, I think the last report I saw, it's 55 or 60% of, of yep. email opens are mobile. Mobile. Yeah. Well, that's, that's open. So it's like, I like, oh yeah, I'll read that later. Right. Read it, deal with it. Especially if I'm going to respond to it, I'll type so much faster to keyboard that it's just a pragmatic decision. Like, yeah, I could, I could get back to that guy a lot better and I won't have as many, <laughs> I won't have as many typos. Um, yeah. Wow. I'm curious, and this is like this is sort of particularly coming from the the angle of of um, the things that our company does, Campaign Genius. But do you see shifts in the balance between SMS and MMS, and what's happening with uh, with media and visuals and the sort of richer component of what that MMS can deliver? Is that on the rise? Is it do, is it behavior just as it's always been, or what? That's a good question. I was actually in a conversation with our demand generation specialist about this um, last week, I guess. And it it kind of depends. I mean, there's so much noise going on <laughs> from so many different channels that it is tougher to stand out. Mm-hmm. And because of that, there and because, I mean, people are continually innovating and we're forever competing with each other. So we're getting better and better about grabbing people's attention. Mm-hmm. And then people adapt and you have to figure out a new way. Yeah. Um, and so one of the ways to get people's attention is richer content. Yeah. And so there is a, I mean, I'll tell you, if you're sending marketing text, messages with an image are almost always going to perform better than messages without an image. Not surprised, but yay. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's that piece to it, but. I think it still comes back to something you said earlier where you can't just be messaging people for the sake of messaging them. You have to have something of value to okay. offer. You something have to have to a say. reason for reaching out. Yeah. Yeah. And because I mean, we, we see it and our customers see it too. And this would apply to, to text as well as to email and other channels. Um, 
a boring plain text, you know, let me ask you a question to start a conversation can be as, as effective and have as high or higher returns as the fanciest template. Right, right, right. It's also where there's context, you know, if I'm getting something rich, interesting, you know, richer media, as you said, from somebody, I wouldn't expect that to be the first thing I get from him because then it would be like, well, wait a minute, why'd you go to all this work? <laughs> to, yeah, to, and also, you can only go downhill from there, right? Like if you start with true. your best, it's not going to get better. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I, I find, um, at least for the businesses that I interact with, just as, you know, just as a person, um, the, the sort of utilitarian and day-to-day -day use of text as a channel is wonderful. Like for some reason, my dentist is totally on top of his texting game. I literally got a text this morning, like you have an appointment on, and I was like, Oh, wow. Thank you. I would have completely <laughs> forgotten that. And they must know that that's a high priority interrupt. Like they ping me there. It's not going to get lost in my inbox. I'm like, Oh yeah, I do have a dental clip. Make sure it's on the calendar and stuff like that. Is that one of the things that you do that you find your customers doing? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting for that particular use case because there's about a 20% lift in kept appointments from those confirmation messages. Which is money in the bank, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm dollar for dollar. I'm more familiar with, with the home service industry. And so you say you're talking 150 bucks for average yeah. cleaning or, or service like that. You know, you send one message and you can have these scheduled in advance, right? So it's, you don't think about it. Um, but a message will cost you what a penny or a few cents and yeah. it gives you an extra 150 bucks. Each, yeah. You yeah. Know? One, one appointment saved and you're ahead for 10 years. It's really interesting too. Cause it, it I, I think, well, I think about uh, this applies to campaign genius too. Cause I just think dynamic content and I see it, we've seen it with a lot of dentists as well and other medical professionals where if someone or even salons, um, people back out last minute, life happens, you know, you're not going to keep everything. Yeah. But then what do you do with that time? Well, you can go to a, a list of customers who are maybe overdue. Um, and you can say, or who are, you know, several weeks out right? and you can say, Hey, we had a last minute opening. Um, right. Right. Do you happen to want idea. it? That's a great idea. And it works. It's a, wow. That's a great idea. Phil. Yeah. That fill in, you know, hairdresser, you know, service industry, like, what, you know, you know, we're going to be in the neighborhood. Do, is there, I, I don't know why that occurred to me. Do, is there, is there any um, really targeted like geofencing capability in text request? Can I say, I just want to get, get to people that I know are within five miles of my, you know, dental office? There is not. It's a very interesting conversation around that because they, well, there's, there's the one piece, right? Like a lot of people who start with geofencing want to, to push out, um, or push notifications. Um, so they want to say, you see a lot with retail where they say, okay, well, you know, it's, it's the weekend. There's a lot of tourist traffic. They've never been here before. Let me just push out notices to the, you know, whoever's in a five square blocks of me, mm -hmm. um, and drive traffic to in store, which is really interesting, a bit invasive, but it works. So it's kind of that, you know, that toss up. Yeah. Um, but then an interesting point, to like, if you're talking text messaging, there, people need to be on your list already. Or I guess it'd be email too. People need to be on, on in your list already, um, or have that opt in, and then you would need to to GPS track where each person is to see if they're in your radius or not. Yeah, yeah. So it gets kind gets of fascinating, daunting. but really, yeah, complex. Yeah, it gets 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 daunting. I mean, for for email, and this is this is this is I, to be blunt, really cutting edge email stuff, but like we can enable someone to email and change the content based on where the recipient is when they open it. Mm -hmm. But it's, that's such a new thing. That's such a new capability for email that frankly, a lot of, you know, customers were, we talked to are still like, wait a minute, what we can, what? <laughs> like, yeah, we could say deliver a pixel. If they're not within range X deliver a coupon if they are within range X. Yeah. And it makes, it makes so much sense too. I'm thinking restaurants is an easy one. Um, yeah. yeah. There's a particular restaurant in Chattanooga that comes to mind. They have, they had four, now they have three locations yeah. all in different neighborhoods around town. And so if, you know, they sent out, I don't know, one thing a day, one thing a week, and it just showed up with whichever restaurant, whichever location you were closest to at that time, 
Perfect. Yeah. Hey, great. Let me, let me walk two blocks. I'll get some tacos. That'll yeah. be fantastic. You know? Yeah. 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 Perfect. Perfect. And that kind of anything we do to get people back in restaurants when we're done with this uh, pandemic mess, <laughs> we want to help them. <laughs> How's that been a total personal sidebar, but has Chattanooga sailed through the pandemic? Okay. It's been, it's been weird yeah, here for Chattanooga sure. Chattanooga is, I, well, Okay, it has negatively affected a lot of people in very profound ways that some people won't recover. Like that's yeah, why. yeah. Um, some businesses have gone out, but it has been great to watch our community come together for each other, and mm-hmm. even uh, and even to see how 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 they come together to keep businesses alive. Um, nice. There is a nice. an entrepreneur in town who his shop is a mile down the road. Um, he's a friend of mine and he was talking about how whenever the pandemic first hit and for us, it was March whenever everything was shutting down and he was thinking, I don't know. I, I don't know how we're going to keep going. I don't know. You know, we, yeah. we're kind of buried, bar- not barely staying, staying up, but, um, you know, he wasn't driving a Lamborghini or anything <laughs> like that. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so he, he was considering closing down and he said, and then he he talked to a few people or a few people customers came and talked to him about how much they needed him and he didn't realize how much you know customers needed the businesses as much as the businesses needed the customers oh that's terrific uh, anyway so it's just been a, a a very fascinating story to watch in town and then i mean for us personally it worked it's worked out pretty well as a company mm-hmm. um probably it's been stressful of course pushed but, stressful but it did, did it actually spur some Things happening faster. It did. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it did. And, you know, a, a lot of people, uh, everything shut down. And so all these companies all of a sudden said, we had to figure out how to let our customers know that we're either open, that yeah. we're taking certain precautions, that yeah. they get home service, that we can still, you know, we have, you know, fewer than 10 people at a job or fewer than five or whatever the number was at that time. So we can still help them out, all these different things. And I'm sure you saw this too. It happened across the whole well, everywhere, um, but a compression of that digital transformation, something that would have naturally taken you know, two or three years happened yeah, completely. in a couple of weeks. Yeah. In a couple of weeks. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which was helpful for us, you know, just from a business, you know, dollars and yeah. standpoint. Um, but it was also tough. I'm sure you saw this too. Tough to watch a lot of customers we worked with for a while. They had to shut down their businesses yeah. and, you know, yeah. we're sad to lose them as a customer, but there's a much more important, story going on behind the scenes that you feel for and we're not you know in terms of that that kick into the digital future you know i i don't think we're going back um i don't think we're gonna gonna even take a half step back on that stuff i mean i i would expect two people going to the office or not it's not going to look like now um but it's also not going to look like a year ago ever again right the Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's it's tough with predictions because like making predictions is always the best way to to look like a fool in hindsight. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, it feels very much like um like an old rubber band. Like we kind of stretch things that we're going to be in. You know, there's that new normal, and then it'll it'll bounce back a little bit, but not not much. Not, it is not, forever changed. Not exactly the same shape, right? And especially with mm-hmm. people. You know, going all you know, I'm going to pick up and move to Chattanooga, Tennessee, right? Like, uh, hey, hey, boss, you you said telecommuting was going to work, and I have a house here now, so I'd like to keep working for you, but I'm not going to pick up and move back, right? Um, I do think I've I've done the remote thing for a very long time and run teams, remotely distributed teams, for a long time, and I don't think it's a great fit for everybody. Um, there are people who really need the social energy and I think they're probably having a miserable time right now, you know, stuck at home yet. It's freedom in one sense, but we're, we're meant to be with each other as well. And cutting that off has got a cost. It's really interesting too. Well, I mean, a lot of this stuff is just interesting to me, but working remote or working from home, in the current times is nothing like, you know, how you've worked from home or worked remote for years, right? You, because you can't just go out to a coffee shop and hang out. You can't go right. to those networking or social events um, yeah. and really get that people time. And so um, 
like I'm an, I'm an introvert. And so, you know, I love people. I like spending time with people, but I get better work done and I recoup whenever I'm by, by myself. Yeah. Yeah. But even I, it's tough for me to work from home for more than a couple weeks at a time without going crazy. And my wife even works from home with me. That's, you know, not a knock on her, but uh, right. no, yeah, um, yeah, I get what you're saying. I just got to get out and see people, you know? I, I, I'm curious because you mentioned it because it's a shared interest. Um, did you have musical activities going pre-pandemic that are now off the table? No, I don't uh. know. But I haven't really I, done musical activities in a while. So you haven't, kind of, they weren't really on the table beforehand. It's like top of my to, list. Going to concerts. I miss that. Yeah, that, that too. At top of my list. Yeah. I just, I'm a fairly active musician and all of that got cut off and just like, God, <laughs> like really a bummer. But yeah, going and singing with people, Bellingham, there's a, not a good idea. No, not at all. Well, and that's the thing. So it just close to, there's a, an uncle of mine up in, over in Kirkland um okay and he, he he was playing i mean he's been he's almost 70 years old and um uh, was playing in a band with five or six other guys you know about his age yeah and they would go they play you know a show they'd practice several times a week and play a show once once a week or so right um he said that was the he's retired and all and, and that's the that was the biggest shift for him is they couldn't go play or do their social oh, things I'll anymore bet. Oh, bad. Um, yeah, that'd be so, so hard, especially yeah. especially if you had an active group like that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's just that's one thing you do together, but it's one that's gotten particularly hit just because of the specific nature of what we're what we're all battling. That and that and I think theater is toast for a while, but oh well. Um, mm-hmm. Bring it, we'll bring it back when we can. Um, we should wrap up because I managed to occupy more of your time than you even promised me. But um, part, you know, if you were talking with a business that says, "Well, text, I don't know," like, what do you tell them? Let's 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 get a parting message that really frames why they should be, you know, looking at what a company like Text Request could do for them. Yeah, so some of it depends on the use case, uh, specifically in how your company operates and all that. But I, I mean, the root of it is we're all trying to boost or increase engagement with our audience whether that's customers whether you're a nonprofit and trying to connect with donors and increase donations mm-hmm. um, you live or die on how well you can interact with your audience and yeah. these days texting is the best way to do that right yeah. it's not the only way but it's something that has to be a piece of of your customer communications uh, and then we just make it really easy to manage that whether it's for one-on-one conversations or for sending messages out to to oh, a large man. list yeah yeah and the return is i mean the average returns 25x the spin so wow yeah there you go there you go well listen kenneth thanks so much it's been wonderful getting getting acquainted a bit and learning about the company and i i appreciate the uh i appreciate the time hopefully we'll get a bunch of listeners learning more about you for the for the time you spent doing this yeah thanks for having me on i really appreciate it mm-hmm.